session is on uh, doing business in the open. So let me uh, first present our session leader, Gail Blondell, from the now uh, European Eclipse Foundation. Gail, take it away. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Astor. So yeah, well, that's a pleasure to moderate this panel about doing uh, business in the open. And yes, I, as you just said, um, we recently announced the uh, creation that the creation of uh, Eclipse Foundation AISDL was finally established in Operation Brussels. And that's a major step in our move to, to Europe, where we, we want to do uh, business in the open globally, but from a, also a, a strong European perspective. So thanks for, for inviting me to, to lead this, this session. And let me introduce my four speakers today. So uh, Birgit Bus has a, a long history as a software engineer at Robert Bosch. Uh, and currently, she's responsible for the IP standardization and open source strategy at Bosch Connected Industry. She has been involved in the national and international standardization of industrial IoT systems since 2017. And she is on the board of the newly funded Industrial Digital Twin Association and chair of the Semantic Data Structuring Working Group of the Open Manufacturing Platform. Hi, Birgit. Uh, Katarina Marake is an attorney at law and strategic advisor at Ambition, a subsidiary of Daimler AG. And she is also a project professor at Kayo University in Japan, where she focuses on IP law and policy and standardization efforts for public uh, licensing schemes. She served as the director of uh, Creative Commons and other responsibilities too. Hi, Katarina. Hi, thanks for having me. Todd Moore is an uh, IBM is VP VP of Open Technology at uh, IBM, where he leads a global IBM team developing open source technologies and working in open communities. And he currently serves as a chairperson of both uh, Open GS Foundation Board of Directors and the CNCF Governing Board. And the quote is that if you consume open source code, you need to give back to the community just as much and more. And I love it. Hi, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, Gerald Pfeiffer has been engaging in open source before that term was ever, even coined. And um, he joined SUSE initially on the engineering side and then led the product organization for over 10 years transforming the, the business from a, a Linux pioneer towards a broader open source infrastructure player. And Gerard currently serves as a CTO based in EMEA and the chair of the board of uh, OpenSUSE. Hi, Gerard. Hey. So let's, uh, let's start with a few, a short introduction with uh, what I have observed over uh, my my own experience with open source i would say that uh, over the years open source has emerged as one of the best way for collaborating on software so we can mention linux of course apache eclipse kubernetes etc um, i think and and i guess that some of you will come back on that later that uh, that's that because of a clear and well understood ip sharing models and that enables the uh, sharing and uh, and also developing larger community of interest. That's easy to set up, and that's an important point. Working in open source is uh, is more easy than creating joint ventures. So when we talk about doing business in the open, that's that's also about creating collaborations in a, in open source. And I think that that was mentioned in the previous panel that uh, this complies with uh, antitrust regulations as well. The results are available to everybody. And so it's easier to, to comply with those uh, competi competition uh, regulations. Um, I, I myself started to work in the world of uh, in the world of open source in 2004 and i think that uh, at that time open source was still a, a commoditization approach 
but I also observed that in the last 10 years, we have seen that uh, new technologies emerge directly in open source, like big data, cloud native computing, IoT, AI, etc. And of course, that's because of some uh, requirements for, for scalability, but uh, also certainly uh, fostering adoption is certainly also, um, also a very important point. And with open source hitting the world, uh, eating, after software hitting the world, open source is clearly eating software. And with uh, topics like uh, industrial IoT that we will, uh, we will address with AI, with cloud, um, I, I think that open source is, is also moving from the traditional software companies to, to the more uh, classical industry players. And that's, that's really interesting today that uh, we have Suze, we have IBM, but we also have Bosch and, and Daimler. So I think that we have this, uh, this uh, clear uh, separation of the two worlds and we will see that we have good connections between them. So let's start with, uh, with you, Gerard. Um, Suze has been a, a pure open source company for a very long time, so since uh, 1992. And you have always been uh, an op well, op open source and free software is really in the DNA of the company. Uh, so tell me more about your, your perspective about uh, doing business in, in the open. Yeah, I think Maria on the previous panel, she asked a very good question. What does it mean to be open? And mm -hmm. in my experience, open source isn't actually sufficient. Um, you can have open source software and, and that came up in the chat even and, and lock in your customers. Um, or you can put in, uh, an open source license on, on a project, publish it somewhere and have no community. So what we're looking at is if you want to be successful in open source and in, in, in a bigger context is actually the 360 degree um, focus on openness. How, how do we conduct business commercially? How do we engage with partners and customers? How do we engage with open source communities? How do we engage even with the like entities like the European Union? Um, and it's, you know, the openness of data, the openness of code, the openness of idea, um, patents being a critical issue and not so easy one all the time. Um, that's really key. And what I found is there isn't actually one mode. If I, if I look at the overly simplifying a, a vendor customer relationship, there isn't just one mode. Uh, there is really also an open source. There's, there's still the classic mode of I'm a vendor, I deliver, service software uh, to you and you consume and you don't necessarily care whether it's open source or not if you if you deploy a new sap system there is uh, today most likely there is SUSE running um, you may not even be aware and that's okay uh, very but that's not necessarily this on, on that front the strengths of open source where open source shines in that context is how do you actually develop that software is it with a hardware partner um, is it then with the software partner so that the overall solution becomes stronger? Where open source becomes more interesting is when you see more of the transparency, um, that openness in what I would call the second mode or modality is where the customer is actually more engaged, is interested in participating in, in open source. Um, and so for I, what I really enjoy is when there are conferences and I hope we'll have real conferences at one point again, but when there are conferences and you see, you see a developer and an engineer or consumer at the customer present at stay on, on the stage, you know, so this is a Kubernetes solution and these are my requirements. And this is what we did on the Kubernetes side to improve. Um, and that's something that open source really enables. Uh, and, and there's even a third mode then, um, in some cases where the customer actually engages in, in an open source project because they are the, the expert um, in say telco. 
Um, and, and so they have very, very specific requirements. And on those specific pieces, they engage directly. They consume the rest of the solution from vendors because that's not their, their expertise, but they want to engage. And so what open source and open business allows is having these dynamic relationships where it's not just you talk to him, you talk to me, I talk to them, but you can invite others. You can invite um, and, and create communities temporarily or permanently. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, oh, we have some echo somewhere. Yes, anyway, uh, Katarina, uh, please please tell us about the the point of view of the industry. You are an advisor at uh, Ambition. So tell me what Ambition uh, is doing and how do you embrace the, the world of open source at Ambition? Yeah, so Ambition is a full subsidiary of Daimler or to be very precise of the Mercedes-Benz AG. And um, I think there are many different reasons why you want to set up a separate entity to start in-house software development. But one very important um, aspect of this is, of course, that you have uh, in a new separate entity, you have the opportunity to implement a new way of working, a different culture, et cetera, quickly. And I think we all know that Daimler is a very um, traditional uh, company in the German context and in the international context. So um, I think, you know, coming from an, a new separate entity, we could implement some of these new ways of working and a different culture. And I'm hesitating to mention the term agile, but of course that plays a big role. So software development is different from the traditional, how do you manufacture a car, right? In the hardware world, how do you make sure that the car ends up on the street? So um, I think ambition really is Daimler's flagship, so to speak. Um, to start in-house software development. And we can already see that because step by step, we closely collaborate with the colleagues um, in Stuttgart and Sindelfingen. So maybe I should say that Ambition is based in Berlin. Um, we try to you know, implement this new way of working, of thinking, the new culture and, and so on and so forth. And I think this is really the, the core piece of the whole storyline uh, around Ambition, to try to you know, bring a software development um, into Daimler. And of course, I mean, this, this panel is about open source. So we're not only talking about software development that plays, of course, a, a huge role, right? So uh, open source is something new, I think in the automotive industry, still somewhat new, and there needs to be more um, education, more discussion, more explanation about the benefits, how we collaborate. I think this has been discussed in this conference already extensively. What does it exactly mean, right? Collaboration in the open. And um, through ambition, Daimler is approaching this and trying to bring this into the more traditional um, uh, yeah, structure of the company. Thanks. Um, okay, so Todd, uh, IBM has, uh, is another software actor that has invested a lot in open source for ever or so, and in all domains. And uh, of course, we all know that this commitment to open source uh, is now even stronger with the acquisition of Red Hat. Um, but in your, in your uh, different roles, can you tell us a few, few things about how you see companies, small and large, succeeding in open source and what it takes? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I've had a front row seat to the open source uh, progress here at IBM. Uh, way back, I had a product that I needed to find uh, a way of meeting a price point, and uh, I couldn't solve that, that problem with the license I had to pay for Unix and uh, started mm -hmm. seeking out uh, Linus Torvald and, and eventually getting going with, with Linux. Um, and it was, it was the interest that you know, we had had already going in open source that allowed us to look at that objectively and say, look, if we, if we invested in it, if we put a billion dollars behind it, which IBM committed, and if we uh, decided not to assert our patents against it, actually pledged not to assert our patents, uh, we could offer it quite a bit of protection and then have uh, 
essentially enterprises be able to put their trust in, in something that they normally wouldn't have. Um, you know, that progressed. Uh, the Apache Software Foundation came about, uh, the HTTP server, which revolutionized what we were, you know, standardizing for, for the web, um, uh, then Java and Eclipse, and of course, the formation of Eclipse with that, you know, the original IBM code donation in there and, and the work that, that went on there, and, and to see that grow and, and become something uh, substantial. Uh, with all sorts of different projects now within it. And now with yourselves moving to, you know, be uh, headquartered in, in the EU in Brussels uh, is, you know, a sign of the times and of, of how uh, the world has uh, changed and, and how uh, having um, positions across the world are now very important uh, to, to how we go about looking at foundations and, and where software is done. Because I think it's the confidence in the software that's most important to both enterprises, uh, small and large. Um, it's that ability to look and see that there's a piece of code that if they're dependent on it, uh, it's being openly governed, right? And that open governance creates then the level playing field, the, the platform by which people can then uh, be engaged and feel comfortable uh, that uh, the rug won't be pulled out from underneath them at some point in the future. And then it's the participation of those companies, and you're seeing it now. And, and uh, Gerald talked about having uh, customers actually get up on stage and talk about what they're doing with the software, but they're also contributing to it. They're also they're commenting it on on it in the most successful organizations that I'm part of now. And and that's that's really been the the, the real shift is the engagement, the the contribution on the part of end users, the contribution on the part of companies. Most software out there these days uh, that's being done in the open has a very strong contingent of people coming from enterprises or or, or companies, right? Um, it, but it's it's not just enough to put the code out under an open license and put it on GitHub uh, to make people feel comfortable. What I've seen um, in terms of making things successful as projects is that eventually um, there's this friction that builds between the community and the project. Uh, you know, being maintained by um, a single vendor, and and there's a choice to be made whether to do something different in your business model, or whether to actively take that project out into open governance and a foundation. So, you know, foundations like the Eclipse Foundation, uh, you know, serve the basis of that, the Linux Foundation, others around the world, um, because it, it gives that opportunity to have that project be very, very successful and, and be essentially a de facto standard, I think. Um, and then you get to the point where you can get to the standardization process. Uh, because, you know, early on, it's very difficult to, as things evolve very quickly um, uh, in, in an open source project to see your way to standardization. Maybe pieces of it can be pulled from standards and other things, but, but it's, it, it's really very, very hard to do that. And the community members are often very resistant to that as well, too. Um, so I think that, that that ability to do things, do things very quickly, really drives uh, both the innovation and uh, the success of the projects as, as they go through time. Uh, you know, we've learned that, uh, I, I'll, very honestly, I, I do quite a bit of advising to companies who are looking to start up their own open source project offices because IBM has been at this probably longer than anybody else and we have a, a wealth of history. and. And, and I've seen small companies and large companies and, and they all wrestle with, you know, essentially some of the same things. It's, you know, first, how do I consume the code um, and, and know that I'm consuming something that is of high quality that I can depend on? Um, how do I go and then start to contribute into these, these projects without losing my intellectual property? Um, and, and there you really need to carefully look at the licensing that you're, you're working with and, and how your people are gonna participate. And, and then I think the, you know, lastly, um, then how do I uh, build this virtuous cycle within my company so that this is part of my product, that I view the code that I'm using in there as my real product code, I'm doing upstream development in it. And uh, as a result of that, um, I have, uh, you know, a basis that I can be very confident that no, no matter what happens out there, I can jump in and have my engineers uh, go and, and be part of that code process and, and be able to make the fixes and changes and things I need. So they all sort of go through that process. It takes them varying amounts of time. 
and uh, eventually uh, they learn to become really good community members. Because uh, it's not just putting code out there on GitHub. It, it really isn't. It's, it's a set of soft skills and a set of community building skills that are so essential to making things successful out there. Yeah, and no, nothing bad about GitHub, but that's not enough. I no, agree. GitHub, great stuff. GitLab, great stuff. <laughs> it's not enough. It, you got to you got to have the soft skills to help you uh, get over that process of working with others. Uh, you know, playing nice in the sandbox together. Yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> Big it uh, about open source and standardization. So you are in this uh, very specific uh, domain of Industry 4.0. That is. Uh, yeah, software uh, entering in uh, the traditional industry and even uh, to some extent in the factory. Uh, and so I that's typically you saw in the chat before that potentially that uh, we had this side conversation about uh, some standardization body. And, and I'm very much interested in, in what you can tell us about what you do in OMP and IDTA about uh, articulation between open source and uh, standardization. Yeah, so, so I, for me, uh, so 2020 was a important year for all of us. It will stay in our minds, but uh, also from a business uh, point of view, from open source and industrial IoT, 2020 is also really extremely interesting. Um, because uh, I, I will tell you, there were a lot of organization um, founded in 2020 all about industrial IoT and um, open source. So I think in general, the awareness of the importance of open source is uh, increasing dramatically also in this area, in industrial IoT. And I think this domain is really a little bit different, like Gail <laughs> just said, than, uh, than the IoT domain. So these are completely different uh, players in the moment. And uh, I think this awareness um, increased not only for the big players, but also for smaller uh, companies in, in industry. Um, so you already mentioned it, um, the uh, industry, so, so I'm focusing mainly on the digital twin aspect because uh, digital twin, um, um, we think uh, in platform industry 4.0 and in, indus yeah, in industrial IT is a very, very important enabler for data-driven business and for interoperability. For, for the main thing is cross company interoperability. So it's about standards and open source. And the Industrial Digital Twin Association was founded just in September, so it's extremely new. And um, I would really say that without um, some effort from some colleagues who did open source to promote our specification, so we did first the specification. Uh, but of course, um, it was a little bit difficult to make a rollout and to get the acceptance of the specification because we had nothing to, to show it in a way that a domain expert can understand it. So a machine builder uh, should understand what we are doing in IIoT. And this helped really uh, uh, much uh, to promote our specification uh, and it uh, did it in an unforeseen way. So it was really enabling um, companies. So on one fair, I think we did a demonstrator and 10 to 15 or 20 different companies all joined one of the same demonstrator just using this simple um, small, um, open source softwares to enable to use the uh, standard and show that interoperability is possible. So this is, um, I would say, uh, the reason why our specification was uh, successful. Uh, and that's why also the Industrial Digital Twin Association was founded. It's not an open source project, but of course, open source is one of the very big pillars from the very beginning because we saw we need it and it will help us um, yeah, drive and fasten all the Industry 4.0 applications. And yeah. And um, okay, the other one, other initiative was already mentioned. It's Gaia X, of course. Um, mm -hmm. Gaia the twins will also be their uh, topics. That's why I'm also mentioning it. And it's very interesting. And it is, it's a very important initiative. And again, it also, this one is not an open source project, but it has open source from the very beginning as one of its pillars. And I think that's a, a, a change of mind in, in doing such business. So um, another foundation um, was uh, founded in 
It's a consortium, it's a digital twin consortium in US. It was founded in the middle of 2020. So all mm -hmm. has yeah, it seems somehow in 2020 it 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 was mature to to, to be done. Um, but they for from they also they are also not an open source uh, um, organization, but they also want to provide open source solution to show how to do digital twins somehow. But they are not doing standards or no specifications, so they for them it's not the main thing to do interoperability to enable interoperability. So I would say for them it's just showcases. Whereas for IDTA and also Industrial Digital Twin Association and Gaia X, it's about really about interoperability. That's why the it's really the combination of standard and open source, and not only open source or only standard. So that's a combination. And um, finally, uh, also the open manufacturing platform, Gael mentioned it, um, is another big player in the world of industrial IoT. It was already founded in 2019 uh, by Microsoft and BMW, but um, Bosch, ZF, and AB InBev just joined at the beginning of 2020, and in a way, this was a real kickoff. And that's the only one, uh, only project that really is an open source project. So, um, so they saw the gap that was missing in industry 4.0 or in an industrial IoT in general, also in US. Um, yeah, that uh, we need something more practical, <laughs> that we need something to show and to, yeah, to, to make it, uh, yeah, faster also, I would say. And the open manufacturing platform is under the umbrella of the Joint Development Foundation. And the Joint Development Foundation joined the Linux Foundation in 2018. So this is also quite new all. And this also shows that uh, because Joint Development Foundation is, is uh, focusing on specific open specifications, Linux on open code development. So again, we have both parts and they are coming closer together. So standardization and open source. So they go well together, I would say. And so to summarize, I would say 2020 was the year for starting all of these initiatives. And now, okay, in 2021, yeah, uh, we should have a look at them, what is happening. <laughs> and uh, because really uh, for IIoT, there is not yet a leading community. It's just starting. It's not IoT. <laughs> yeah. Now that all the organizations are created, uh, that's the right <laughs> time for execution. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Katharina, um, Todd in in uh, his answer covered some something that is uh, interesting which is uh, first you need to to be able to consume software and you you created the software compliance academy so maybe you tell us a few few words about it and what it where it can help companies and uh, in the, at the beginning of this learning curve sure yeah thank you um, I think uh, today, even still in the corporate world, the first uh, approach to open source or the first contact with open source still quite often is through compliance, right? So it's um, not necessarily being admonished or, you know, something bad happening, but realizing that, you know, you do have open source in your products and the licensing model is somewhat different. So I think many companies, if we really talk about the corporate world, many you know, legal departments or even developers in the corporate world, at some point realize that you know, they, they need to somehow learn how to handle this and how to you know, understand the licenses and what that really means for their products. And I think this is a need that we saw happening five, six years ago that quite often companies don't really want to have legal advice being charged by the hour, but they want you know, some support in the terms of, you know, what do we actually have to do? What does this mean? What do we need to change? And I really liked also what Todd said before, because I think open source is, is not only about the licensing model. It's not only about putting something up in GitHub. It's about the corporate culture, right? So, what we are trying to you know work with clients or help companies is to understand what does this mean to make this shift from you know a traditional software company to an open source company and and it's really far beyond just understanding the licensing model it's about setting up a different way of working that means you know certain processes understanding how the collaboration model works 
identifying with whom you want to collaborate and so on and so forth. So I think it's it's a big package that you know um, traditional companies have to unlock uh, when they start working with open source. But the entry point and that um, to come back to your question, in our experience, quite often is through compliance, right? So the, the question, what do we need to do? We need to somehow deliver the source code maybe, or you know, other obligations, fulfill other obligations in the licenses. And then step-by-step step, uh, companies realize what this really means and what the opportunities are, right? Um, because they're huge opportunities. And, and that's when, when mm -hmm. we are successful if, if companies are, you know, working in the open source world from successfully and not only putting stuff on GitHub and claiming that they are now an open source company. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, well, Astor asked me to go as fast as we can. So we still need more, min more minutes, Astor. Take it easy. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gerald. Uh, one thing, and I see also in the chat that uh, it, there, there's some discussion about skills, and you you have been doing all your all your career in open, in open source. So, what what is your perspective about this, and and yeah, about skill gaps and uh, training or this kind of stuff? You on mute? Not anymore. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> we need more developers, designers, architects with skills. So one, one part around skills is um, we need more education. And when I say education, we have very good technical universities, colleges here in Europe. What I'm sometimes missing is the softer side. Um, so soft skills, how do you build communities, communications? How do you engage in communities? A little uh, connected to what, what Todd referred to. Um, and I think we can become better or we should become better at selling actually the virtue of open source for individuals, for employees. Because open source is an employee market if you look at it. Um, your skills that you develop are very portable. You can move from one mm -hmm. open source vendor. If I if 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 I got the job offer, um, if Todd extended me a job offer, I probably could move. I could move and and work in in open source projects and with the same technologies I'm I'm aware of, with a very small barrier of entrance. Um, and also GitHub has been mentioned and, and and those other tools. You actually, as a developer, keep promoting yourself all the time. Every single commit that you're paid for by your employer goes directly on your resume that your GitHub profile is. Um, mm -hmm. And so as an, as an employee, I think, um, as an engineer, designer, et cetera, um, open source, uh, number one, it's a lot of fun. I think you, you'll probably appreciate the openness, the collaborations with more partners, the, the engagement with customers, which can be more direct. Um, but also you have lots of opportunities to move across, you know, across the continent. In the past, I would have told you, you can work from home um, because many organizations um, are in the open source arena are more skilled, um, have been historically skilled to, to, to do remote work and distributed work. In, in this day and age of the virus, that maybe not that much of a differentiator anymore, but let's see um, two years from now. So I think, Working in open source is actually, apart from being very rewarding, exciting, um, is actually from a pure career perspective, um, a very positive thing. Thanks, Gerard. Um, yeah, so, so I think that I see Astor, so it looks like it's, uh, it's time to conclude and, and we, we will be able to say that the, the business people have uh, saved the time that was overtime from the policy people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so just as a, just as a conclusion, uh, I th I I think that we have several uh, several aspects. Uh, I like the idea of uh, companies uh, first start to consume, 
consume open source code and so they need compliance and they realize they should contribute that that's an opportunity for collaboration and at some point that becomes more uh, more uh, strategic and uh, and more of a collaboration platform for them uh, the second one uh, i would say is that uh, open source and standardization go well together especially when you you need to have some uh, interoperability I like to say that open source is uh, standards that run, so you you get the extra uh, soul of uh, of the standard with this, with the actual software. Um, and what one thing I think that uh, in the presentation of the studies there was a lot about uh, the fact that the small small companies we have lots of small companies in in Europe and I realize that in our panel we have only. Uh, large companies represented i would say uh, but uh, in my perspective from my experience i would say that uh, there is one important aspect in open source which is this network effect and this network effect is a, a huge opportunity for all organizations whether they are small or large and and yes to to conclude my conclusion i will that's that's really about uh, yes publish publish code publish code on GitHub if you think that's the the best platform and if you if as a developer that's a place to to have your your CV but uh, but from from publishing code on a platform to doing business in the open there is a governance a intellectual property management community development that's that's a lot of of things that that must be also uh, addressed. Thanks Perfect. everybody for your participation. You. And we are just a bit uh, shorter. I think that uh, you all gave us good, uh, good insights. And thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Okay. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah.